My whole life I'd been interested in humour and in laughter. Um, I'd always been interested in comedy. I wanted to make comedy when I was young. Um, and, and then when it came time to do my research, uh, my PhD, I was interested in, uh, I was a, a scholar of the Middle Ages, you know, I was learning to be a scholar of the Middle Ages, in the 12th and 13th centuries. And I was choosing other topics. I was interested in law, bureaucracy, I was interested in politics in different ways. And, um, and, and one day it occurred to me that humour has been the thing that has driven my interest for so long. Uh, maybe I could put the two together and maybe I could do a study of medieval humour. Um, really, for me, laughter is one of the most important things there is in communication. I mean, someone did a study, it's every 20 seconds apparently in any conversation there's laughter. It's much more often than we think. Uh, we laugh all of the time and of course, it goes without saying that that laughter is doing a lot of work. It's doing a lot of communication work, obviously, but really um, laughter is doing something else. It, it's obviously part of power relations. It obviously has a politics attached to it, or it can have a politics attached to it. For example, the recent Ukrainian election is a fascinating case study where the candidate who had been a comedian uh, is elected uh, president, right? And uh, what does this say about what laughter and comedy can do as a form of politics? I, I think he answered a wonderful question. They said, well, what would you do about what do you have to say about Ukraine's roads? And he said, I have nothing to say because there are no roads. It's a good joke. Uh, does it do something that a more formal answer to that question couldn't do? I think it does. I think in that moment of laughing, we see something, we see something terrible, <laughs> if you like. Um, Donald Trump in the United States, another example where humor can have this, where a clown can become a prince, you know, where a clown can apparently do something more powerful or can speak to people on a level that, uh, that maybe you know, more rational discourse cannot. I'm not saying it's a good thing at all, I'm just observing that sometimes laughter can be enormously powerful, it's, it's coming to, to bear. It used to be said that laughter was always conservative, that really what you're doing when you're laughing is you're, um, you're kind of, you're, you're reducing things back to a common sense. I'm laughing at that, ah, oh, it's ridiculous. It's kind of saying we should go back to something that isn't ridiculous, right? But I think also laughter can sometimes do something much more radical. Laughter can sometimes make us reflect that we're in fact, we are ridiculous, that the human itself is ridiculous, that all attempts to bring order to, to life, which is what humanity kind of tries to do. We dress up in suits, we pretend we're you know, reasonable people, but really we're animals underneath, right? Some, some would say, and that maybe laughter exposes us, reminds us of our inner ridiculousness, that all attempts to bring order and measure and rule to our lives are futile because really we're laughable animals. Um, now my problem with medieval history, uh, as it was, I mean, or one of, my, one of my concerns with doing medieval history was that uh, that we didn't take account of the humorous moments, the, the parts where there's deliberately irony or there's, things aren't as they seem. I mean, we rely solely on texts. All we know about the 12th and 13th centuries is textual. Uh, so I, I, was always, I always had this anxiety that we were missing something, that we are missing some layer of irony or humor or those little moments of relief, if you like. There are, generally speaking, there are three theories of laughter, of why we laugh and what laughter does. The first theory is superiority. It's this idea that we laugh when we come to recognise that we're really superior to something. It's a moment of sudden glory um, where we, we recognise that, uh, oh right, we've, we've released ourselves from this at least. You know? In other words, every joke, there's a butt of every joke. So you have to be, uh, you have to be mocking something. Uh, another theory of humour is uh, repression, Freud's theory. The idea that essentially um, laughter expresses our unspoken, unacknowledged desires, that every joke is like something within us that we want really coming up, uh, bubbling up through the surface. And the third theory, the theory that interested me most is incongruity. This idea that comes from Omri Bergson uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century, Bergson's little book, Laughter. And he says that laughter is really something mechanical encrusted on the living. What he means by that is that we laugh in moments when we recognise something artificial, something which uh, is restricting a kind of natural human life. Now this is silly in a way, obviously, because well, what is natural human life? But I think there's something in there. I think laughter drawing attention to artificialities and incongruities, I think that's a really interesting way to think about what laughter is. So my research is all about 
really um, looks at laughter in the 12th century, the 1100s, in, in Western Europe, but mostly in England and France, looks at laughter as revealing some kind of incongruity um, in, in how that, that state, in, or these states in, in England and France are operating. So um, my interest is in the court of Henry II, English king, between 1154 and 1189. And this is a time when England, and Europe generally, but particularly England, is undergoing this enormous change. Okay, this, before Henry II was, was king uh, of England, there was anarchy. All right? It was a time of total chaos. There was a civil war. Um, rule and order, if you like, um, effectively didn't exist. We had something like bastard feudalism. People um, gaining what they want by force um, more than by procedure. Right? Um, Henry comes in and he has this idea in 1154 that he's going to restore the law and order that was in his time of his grandfather. Right? Um, in reality, Henry really actually begins to innovate these new procedures that had never been there before, um, written mechanisms for law, for how you get justice, um, um, using archives for the first time in a really instrumental way, um, and, and a, a series of other procedures, documentary procedures, the, the exchequer, formalising the exchequer as a way of processing finances. Right? So all of these laws and mechanisms come in to regulate political life. Now this is where laughter comes in, because my theory is that actually laughter becomes a shadow mechanism. Laughter reveals the tension, enormous tension, at this kind of imposition of rule, order, procedure onto uh, a previously fairly um, charismatic, anarchic um, political order. So the 12th century, what happens in the 12th century? In the 12th century, my argument is that laughter, and my research shows this, laughter becomes suddenly very, very powerful. Uh, people start talking about laughter as if it had some kind of uh, enormous power, not just political power, but almost at times supernatural power. So what do I mean by this? Um, around about the year 1100, before this period, um, laughter really has diabolical associations, particularly in, in Christian writing. It, people don't write about laughter as if it's a good thing. They write about laughter. Uh, um, it kind of weighs upon your soul. The more you laugh, the more damned you are. Uh, because laughter is wicked in, in their view. Laughter is something, and humour is cruel. It's a cruel sport. It doesn't serve a function. A, a speech makers should not laugh. Kings should not laugh. You should not mock a monarch. Uh, Henry I, Henry II's grandfather, when he's mocked, there's a mocking song about him, he has the guy's eyes gouged out. Um, that's the punishment for, for, you know, for reckless laughter. Um, in the 12th century, laughter becomes very powerful. It, it, this whole thing is overturned. Suddenly it becomes a really positive thing. Um, monastic and theological writers write about laughter as if it has this uh, spiritual power. Um, if you're having a mystical experience, you're experiencing God's presence within you, you may well laugh. Laugh to express this moment of exhilaration. Uh, uh, rhetoricians talk about the, the value, the virtue of, of making people laugh, to not just to sweeten a message of a, of a speech, but also to kind of do some work in them processing the idea. Make people laugh, they will understand uh, in a way that they didn't uh, before. Um, and uh, also medical writers start talking about laughter as if it's a good thing. Previously, laughter, oh, it's a sign of an overactive spleen. There might be some disease in your body if you're laughing too much. Maybe you're having a manic attack. Um, by the later 12th century, oh, laughter is a sign of, you know, you've got some good blood, your humour's well balanced, um, it's a positive sign of health. So that's quite interesting. Uh, politically, what's happening in the 12th century, uh, alongside those intellectual changes and in how laughter is viewed, laughter becomes instrumental, it becomes a way of doing politics. Uh, so Henry II's court, courtiers talk, um, they talk more and more about the value of laughter uh, and humour as ways of getting things done. Now, at a practical level, it's fairly cruel. Um, you can bring down your rivals through a well-timed joke. You know, satire uh, can expose corruption. It can undermine your kind of political enemies. Uh, okay, so laughter is really useful in that way. Humour is really useful in that way. Uh, but also, it does something a lot more. It, it comes to be valued as kind of a high watermark of your virtue as a courtier. Uh, if you can make people laugh in the right way, and if you can laugh yourself in the right way at the right things, then you can kind of show your belonging to the highest echelons of, of court society. In, in many ways, it articulates your power. What does this mean? Well, on the one hand, uh, 
um, there are these jokes that circulate and these kind of um, satirical uh, writings and that kind of like your, your involvement in these courtiers, uh, Henry's court, who circulate these things, they have this cachet, right? Um, on the other hand, a lot of the humour is itself extremely elite. So you're laughing at Latin puns, you're laughing at uh, the kind of rustic speech of people who don't really fit in the court society. That humour is a kind of way of marking out the boundary. Um, but more than that, really, it's a way of winning favour with the very, very most power, the most powerful people. It's a way of winning favour with um, with the king and the king's close familiars. And I suppose the, there are a couple of examples of that. There are a couple of bishops. A guy called Roger of Worcester, who makes his entire career like he, he does all sorts of things that sort of sail too close to the wind. They're a little bit too. Um, they're too sort of. They. they, they take his power beyond what he should have as a courtier. He's almost acting like a king himself, but he gets away with it because he makes the right joke at the right time and everything is forgiven. The, the culmination, I would say, of this 12th century power of laughter is with the king himself. Uh, and my theory is that in the 12th century we get this, the birth of this image of this laughing king, a laughing kingship. It's a new kind of kingship. Scholars have looked at this before, they've said, oh, laughing kingship is kind of a mode. Um, but for me, it's really a political, it's a real political mode. It's something that gets something done that could not otherwise be done. It's not just an image of a king's benevolence. The laughing king is someone who does something that the serious king cannot. And what the laughing king does is he manages to absorb the laws, to work with the, the new governmental laws of bureaucracy and codes, um, in political society, but also move beyond them. Someone who's able to create a state of exception, uh, which allows procedure to run, but also supersedes it. What do I mean by that? Henry II, as Laughing King, is someone who, as I've said, um, instills a whole range of laws throughout the land, okay? So uh, there are new mechanisms, you know, if, if someone invades your land, you now have a right, a legal right, a procedure, whereby you, the claimant, can get that land back. Henry II, however, uses laughter as a way to supersede this. So when someone um, comes to him and says, my son has, um, has dispossessed me of my land, my son is a knight um, and he wants my land, you know, and he, I, I was off somewhere else and he's invaded and now he's inherited before I'm dead. And this was actually legal. It was, it was within the bounds of mechanism um, under Henry II. But, Henry takes sympathy, he says, even though this is the law, he laughs at this, he laughs at this situation. I can't, it's so funny that this has happened, that, you know, he's inheriting before you're dead. And he says, well, you know what, we're going to waive the law in this circumstance. And he uses his sovereign authority to, to um, make a state of exception and reinstate um, the claimant's land. This is just the kind of thing that laughter represents. It represents this moment of rupture where the law and procedure are kind of superseded and the king's sovereign authority appears in its naked form. Uh, there are many other examples of this. Um, another famous example is when Henry II finds two uh, drunks who have been drinking all of the wine in his wine cellar. It's his private collection. He's appalled, right? And these two drunks are brought before him and apparently they've been slandering his name. They've been slagging off uh, the king as well. And uh, they're asked to explain themselves. What, why did you do this? What, explain yourselves. And they said, look, we said some terrible things, but it's nothing to what we would have said if you'd let us finish all the wine. Uh, and it's a joke, right? And the king laughs. He really laughs. He loves this joke. And he lets them off. Okay, so in the moment that they have managed to use their wit, and in the moment that the king himself is kind of dissolved in laughter, in that moment, the law, it, it, it's meaningless. Or it's maybe not meaningless. It is, it is suspended and the sovereign's naked power appears again. So my research really has been about uh, looking at laughter as kind of an index to, on the one hand, tensions, tensions in, in, um, in, in what government and politics are, how they work. And the tension being that rule and law and procedure are fantastic ways of, of, of almost running a, a country or an empire um, from a distance, you know, of running it almost on autopilot. They work really well, but they produce inequalities and inequities all the time. There are so many cases where normal law and procedure don't seem to quite do true justice. And I believe it's in these moments that laughter is kind of an index 
It's kind of a shadow mechanism which comes in. Humour and laughter sort of draws attention to this incongruity between what the law has done and what should have been done. And the laughter sort of, that moment of humour creates a kind of state of exception. It creates this uh, moment of relief and release in which a kind of higher law or justice a more immediate law of justice or a more naked sovereignty can work. Um, that's one thing. The other thing really that my research has been looking at is, is how laughter itself seems to have a power. It seems to be able to express something within the human uh, which is transcendent. Uh, it seems to take the human outside of normal, its normal sphere of operation. Laughter seems to represent that moment of ecstatic release. Uh, and this, is, this really translates into the spiritual sphere. The 12th century also sees, I argue, the emergence of the laughing saint as a motif. This idea that um, saints, at the moment of high exhilaration, at the moment that uh, a saint is martyred, or at the moment a saint has a prophetic vision, or a moment that a saint performs a miracle, there's laughter. The laughter that is able to express that ineffable sphere of operation, if you like, or that ineffable power that simple words cannot, um, that laughter itself can express something divine.